Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. My name is Kitty Mary and not very long ago, on March 20th, the final installment of the IPCC report was published. And reviews were mixed. I talked a little bit about it on Instagram and I got a bunch of questions about the IPCC report itself, what this specific installment, the sixth assessment said. Also just a lot of uh, source credibility related questions about IPCC in general. Also just a lot about how to find the best resources when looking into climate. So I thought for today's video I wanted to sit down and have a chat. I'm a little bit ill. If you can hear it, I apologize. I wanted to sit down and have a chat about what the report contains and also a little bit about what the IPCC is. How to explain to people what types of sources, what types of research is credible and what type of research really isn't. Overall, this, is, this could be a much longer video, so there might be a lot of stuff I end up leaving out. However, I think we need to have this conversation and also I thought I wanted to give you guys a comprehensive overview of what this report contains. I was almost terrified uh, as to how quickly the news of the IPCC report's final installments publication went into the background of everybody's news feeds. I didn't hear about it for more than 20 seconds before it was overshadowed by some other news. And this is... When I say it's really important, it's kind of the understatement of the year. It's quite important. <laughs> so the fact that so many news platforms just left it in the background or didn't even pick it up and talked about it is wild to me, is unfathomable to me. So let's get into this video. Well, let me explain what the IPCC is. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was founded in the late 1980s. That's what IPCC stands for, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It's an organization that seeks to gather information about climate change from the scientific, from the technological and the socio-economic point of view. Comprehensively gather it in a single little cute package. IPCC is not a collection of individuals, it's a collection of countries and governments. And when it comes to research, they are about as transparent as they come. Everything is on their website and everything I'm about to tell you, you can also look up on the IPCC website. You can find out everything you need to know about the reports, who wrote them, where they were in the world and how they did it. It's also important to note that the IPCC is not a research organization. They gather research from scientists all around the world. They don't carry out research themselves. It's more a body that evaluates information and knowledge about climate change and how to use that politically. This can also be quite important to remember in terms of greenwashing, but the IPCC reports do not recommend or dictate consumer behavior. And I have much often seen advertisements or statements online saying that the IPCC reports tells people to do this or this or that. It tells people to put up windmills everywhere. It tells people to change their lives in this and this direction. The IPCC report tells people to carbon offset their flights. The IPCC do not dictate any consumer behavior. They present projections. So if you hear or see someone state that the IPCC is telling people to do this or that, they either aren't being truthful or they are misunderstanding what the report is trying to convey. These projections made in the report is meant to function as a base for climate-related policies created by governments. That's their primary purpose. They are less so lifestyle guidelines for consumers and more so a body of knowledge that governments can look at when creating their policies. And every country supporting the IPCC reports have to approve them before they're published. Unfortunately, a lot of the governments that are approving the reports aren't really taking its advice. But yes, there is a lot of the knowledge in the reports that also can be applied to consumers, that can be used as lifestyle guidelines, and it would definitely be beneficial for people to do that. But it's important to remember that that's not the primary purpose of the report. I saw someone mention on Instagram that the IPCC was bribed to remove certain advice or recommendations about plant-based living and they were bribed by lobbyists from animal agriculture to not state that veganism is the most sustainable diet and I find that quite hard to believe. First of all, 
because eating more plants actually is in the report. But it's not the purpose of the report to state that one diet is more sustainable than other diets. That is not that's not the purpose of the report. It doesn't mean that the IPCC is against plant-based diets. It just means that it's not the IPCC's job to recommend or dictate that. Also because scientifically speaking, it's not necessarily sustainable for everybody in the world to be vegan. It is sustainable for everybody in the world to reduce animal products, but that is not the same thing. So of course they can't say that. Like, of course they cannot say that. Anyway, now I mentioned lobbyists, I want to talk a little bit about how the IPCC report is funded. Because one critique that I have seen and heard about the IPCC from many different perspectives is that they are funded by certain lobbyists that bribes them or pays them to remove some information or add some information in their own favour. Now, the annual budget of the IPCC is about 5 to 8 million euros. I know that because it says so on their website. And it's financed by the 195 members of the UN. The authors and members of the IPCC is also not getting paid for their work. It is voluntary scientific work. Either way, I would be a lot more scared of the lobby funding that goes into the fossil fuel industry than I would be of potentially someone lobbying the IPCC. I'm just saying, those are different numbers. 5 to 8 million euros is not a lot of money. It is a laughable amount compared to what's happening in fossil fuels. So if someone is getting bribed in the IPCC, they are underpaid. Now let's talk about how the IPCC picks their sources. Because I have seen many a critic claiming that the IPCC is only cherry picking sources that agree with what they are already trying to convey and simultaneously ignore other types of evidence to make themselves look better. It's funny how some people that only get their knowledge from blogs where the only work cited is trust me bro suddenly knows so much about source credibility what do you know also wouldn't it make the ipcc look way better if they were able to scientifically prove that our projections are not as bad as everyone is saying i mean, i digress but that just seems like that would be more beneficial to everybody if that was the final product now when it comes to sources everything that is peer-reviewed and published in a journal will be considered as a source for the IPCC reports. Even sources that challenge the status quo. However, there is a consensus among scientists globally that human actions has caused climate change. That is a scientific fact, it's not an opinion, it's not an ideology, it's not someone being brainwashed, it's, it's just numbers on paper. Now the planet's climate has always been in a state of flux, has always been changing, but it's the intensity and speed with which the climate is now changing that is caused by human actions and activities. It has never happened this quickly before in the history of our planet, and it's because of our global greenhouse gas emissions that it's happening now. I don't even want to discuss that if that's the case or not, because if you do still not believe that that is the case, I don't, I, I don't know if I can help you, honestly. I don't know if my talk about credibility and sources will do a whole lot to change that then. Now, what does the IPCC report say then? On March 20th, 2023, the final sixth installment of the IPCC report was published and it represents eight years of work from the bodies of science with the highest authority. 234 scientists from the physical science of climate change, 270 scientists from impacts, adaption and vulnerability to climate change, and 278 scientists on climate change mitigation. As such, this report is some of the most comprehensive some of the most readily available knowledge that is the most credible that we will ever be able to gather on the subject of climate change. And it's not very cheerful reading, but the report details the consequences of a rising greenhouse gas emissions, which means the destruction of homes and habitats, the loss of livelihoods, the fragmentation of communities, and the dangers should we fail to change our course. However, the IPCC also highlights potential pathways that can help us reduce the consequences. This report highlights available means and cost-effective solutions to these issues. Actions that can help lower our global carbon footprint, our greenhouse gas emissions, but also scale up resilience. However, one piece of information that is overshatteringly crucial from this report, should we only take one thing from it, is that the window in which we can act effectively is closing. 
and I know we have been saying this for a long time. I know this is something that people in science have been saying since the 60s, but it's happening. I don't know what to tell you. First of all, the temperature change we have seen of 1.1 degrees Celsius that's caused by human activities has spurred changes in our climate on our planet that are unprecedented in human history. What we are seeing now has never happened before. Number two, climate impacts on people and ecosystems are much more severe than we anticipated. And the risk for future escalation becomes more severe with every fraction of temperature increase. Number three, there are many means with which we can build resilience and actively combat the issues, the consequences, the risks that we are seeing. However, those means are in dire need of financial funding, which I guess every single eco-friendly initiative and organization can agree with. Number four, some climate impacts are already so severe that there is no way we can adapt to them. We are going to have to face the fact that some things are now just permanently damaged or lost. Number five, global greenhouse gas emissions will have to peak before 2025. Number six, the world must rapidly shift away from using fossil fuels, which is the number one cause of climate change. Number seven, we also need urgent system-wide transformations to secure a net zero future. Number eight, carbon removal from the atmosphere is a pretty essential when it comes to limit the temperature increase on Earth. Number nine, climate finance must rapidly increase within this decade, both in terms of mitigation and adaption. We need widespread funding of climate positive projects. And I know this is pretty terrible news. It's okay to feel frustrated or angry or scared or just really pissed off. That's okay. But this is not to say that whatever the individual is now doing doesn't matter. It's not to say that we are all doomed. That's not the message I want to convey. And it's also not really the message of the IPCC report. I think a lot of people hear the first half of the we're at 1.1, if we get to 1.5, we're screwed. And then they just really shuts it all down because it feels like too much. It feels overwhelming. It feels like you become insignificant because saving the planet is a pretty big task and how a lot of people tend to shut this kind of information out and I totally get that. But hear me out, you're also kind of allowed to do that. You don't actually have to take that in. If you're reducing your impact, if you're voting green, if you're doing everything you can in your everyday life to implement sustainable actions, this report is not for you. To be a little bit frank, this report is not meant for consumers. This report is meant for governments. So you shouldn't really be carrying the entire responsibility of acting according to the IPCC report. That is not what this is about. This report is meant to first and foremost function as a base for climate policies. So if reading this report or talking about this report demotivates you from doing green things or, or engaging with sustainability, then maybe this kind of climate action is not for you. Then focus on the type of climate actions that inspire you or motivate you and let governments think about the IPCC report. It's really them it's meant for. Now, personally, I find it incredibly motivating to look at science, to look at reports, to get an overview and gather knowledge. I think that's one of those things that inspire me personally to be better in my everyday life. It might not be that way for you and that's okay. Then find another type of climate action that motivates you the same. Limiting the temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius is still possible. This report makes it clear that what we need to do is peak at our global greenhouse gas emissions by 2025, then halve them by 2030 and then reach mid zero around mid century. And if your individual human brain cannot comprehend the magnitude of that, that's okay. It's not really supposed to either. I can honestly barely comprehend what I will have for dinner next week. So let alone imagining the transition to net zero by mid-century and all the transitions that entails could just as easily be a piece of fiction. I would not understand it any better. I've seen a lot of people call the IPCC report fear-mongering or fear propaganda. I see that being thrown around quite a lot. And the thing is, if this report was meant for consumers, if this report was meant to say, these are the ways we need to adapt and change our behavior, then I would be pretty prone to say, yeah, that kind of sounds like fear-mongering because how the fuck are we gonna get to net zero by mid-century? 
by refusing plastic straws. It doesn't make any sense. Consumers don't necessarily have that kind of power. We can only really be sustainable within the system that is built up around us, and that system is built up by governments. The same government that's meant to be the main receiver of this report. Okay, so I wouldn't call this fear-mongering. If consumers and individuals like myself are reading it, it's because we want to gain an overview. If you are not inspired or motivated by that overview, then it's not for you. Then vote green and, and, and do your sustainable things and you'll be fine. Put it in another way, consumers are not the center of climate science. And consumer action actually has very little to do with fossil fuel investments, coal lobbying and climate policies. We drive cars, we buy products and we vote. The rest of it is built up around us. And these reports are meant as foundations for governments to build their climate policies around. Now to say this report was not meant for consumers is not the same as saying consumers don't have power because people need to push and we probably need to push more than what's fair which the report also points out. And this is actually a brilliant opportunity to rebuild the systems that we already know, to rebuild them in more inclusive, more effective, more sustainable ways, if we dare to do that. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say that this isn't terrifying. It is terrifying, I'm shaking, but I'm not going numb from anger or terror. I am more so just really incredibly motivated to fix this. And I'm not going to fix things by myself, like I cannot save the planet, but I can remember this feeling every time I'm feeling small or every time I'm faced with an opportunity to choose something more sustainable. Every time I have to vote, every time I talk to people about climate change, every time I talk about sustainability, both privately and also in my job, and I can ask questions and I can help normalize the conversation about climate change. Because actually that is some of the most important things we as consumers can do. It's making sure that it feels normal to talk about climate change because if we're scared to talk about it, either because it terrifies us or because we're scared that we're not good enough at talking about it or because we're scared someone will correct us, we're not going anywhere because consumers need to push, individuals need to push because as we can see, there's a lot of companies and a lot of governments that's not going to do anything unless consumers really want it and not only ask for it, but kind of demands it so I hope this video doesn't come across as fear-mongering. At least that wasn't my intention. And yeah, I think there should be a way of dealing with specific information that can be scary without harvesting or exploiting that feeling in other people, which I feel like is not what we are doing here. Anyway, if you were looking for an overview, I hope you got that. And yeah, I hope you like this video. If you have any questions or comments, leave them down below. If there are any aspects of this that I didn't get to talk about in this video, let me know down below. Perhaps we should do a part two or generally talk more about these types of publications when they come out. Let me know if you want more current climate news reviews, etc. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Have an amazing day. Take really good care of yourself and I'll see you guys next time. Bye. Thank you so much for watching this video and also a special thank you to my Patreon supporters. You guys help me create green zero waste contents and I love you guys. You can find the links to my social media accounts down below and the link to my Patreon on this screen. Bye!